Hey guys, I'm back doing the video like this today um, because it's a different kind of video. It's one of the ones where I'm just going to chat at you for a little bit because this is another viewer request. So I got me and Tato the Destroyer, Tato the Wonder Dog, Tato the Very Good Boy, yeah, who's a good boy? He's a baby. He's a big old baby. I just picked a shady spot in the yard and I hope that the bug sound is not too bad today. Uh, it has been described as ear rape by somebody, I understand. But I'm kind of on the tail end of that killer cold that was just killing me. I turn into a giant baby when I'm sick. And I want to spend a little bit of time in the uh, fresh air, try to get my body flushed out of all those little nasties because it's my last day like this before I have to shave, put a uniform on and go back to work tomorrow after taking a few days off. So I don't have my shout out list with me, so I'm not gonna be able to do any shout outs today, but I have like five videos I'm filming today. So I'll get them done. One of the best things about a dog like this that I love is their loyalty and they know when you're not feeling well and they know when something's wrong and this guy has not left my side since the first sniffle hit me and the first laying down on the couch and not feeling well. What a good boy. Anyway, so um, somebody had asked if I would do a video on kind of the story of how I got into knife collecting. Oh, there goes loyalty. Frowny face. Uh, somebody asked if I would do a video on how I got into knife collecting and how I, I turned that into a channel and how that all happened. And I thought that sounded like a good idea. I don't know if you guys think that's a good idea. So this is your chance now to stop the video and say next and move on. Because um, I have some knives we're going to look at and everything. But this isn't going to be um, not action-packed and adventure-filled, although it is going to talk a little bit about deployment and stuff. But that's what we're going to talk about because uh, I think it's a it's a worthwhile topic. Everybody has their own story about how they get into, you know, being into knives, whether it's just one really good knife that you love and you carry daily, or you have a whole collection. Uh, and then a few different people have asked me from time to time, hey, how do you get into making videos and, and how do you do that? And I still don't think that I have a really successful channel. It's okay, but I mean, there are some folks out there with like 60,000 subscribers, you know? So there are people that do this, obviously, I mean, way better than me. Uh, I just have a little channel going because it's fun and I like interacting with people and I learn new things and uh, get new ideas and everything. But, so we'll get into that. So you ready? Do you want me to wait a minute while you get a snack or a drink or anything like that? You know, because there will not be an intermission. I'm waiting. I'll assume you have a snack or a drink or something like that at this point. I should have brought one out here with me. I know sometimes I come off as like a knife snob. But really, I don't think of myself as a knife snob. I don't believe that a knife has to be expensive to be really high quality or good, and that's what I think a knife snob is. I do insist that a knife be high quality and be made decently. Um, I, I like high quality materials. I like the better steels and I like the better handle materials, but I don't think a knife has to be made out of one of those super steels to be a really good knife. So you can kind of, on your knife snob spectrum of yay to yay you can you can fit me in however you want to put me there uh, but I, I don't feel like I am a snob I just expect a lot out of a knife when I buy one because first and foremost I look at a knife as a an essential tool of the trade you know in the military it's something that we're always going to carry and whether we're using it for utility whether we're using it for just useful EDC or whether we're actually using it as a tool to defend ourselves and possibly save a life out there it has a lot of different functionality, and that's what I look at first is functionality. Hi, Tato. What I look at second is the form. You know, I look at what does it look like. Because, yeah, I, you know, you want a knife that feels good, looks good. Um, obviously, you want a knife that you ha think has a, a cool look to it. And then I also look at a lot of knives as kind of art. There are some I have in my collection that I believe are sort of artistic and... It is a piece of art. You know, there are, every knife is is a piece, just like a painting, just like a sculpture, you know, and it reflects on the creator's care and time and talent that they put into creating it. So a lot of different ways you look at it. Never been a huge knife collector though, until fairly recently. It's always just been growing up, you know, my dad taught me and my dad is the real deal. My dad is my hero. My dad is the for real, no shit, uh, triple Tower of Power, uh, Airborne Ranger Special Forces, retired Colonel type. He raised me to have a, a good respect for a good quality knife growing up. Uh, I was not really into sports growing up when other kids were 
doing a lot of sports and stuff, my dad was taking me out into the woods and teaching me how to build tripwires and things like that, which I'm not complaining about. It was a lot of fun. And then I joined Little League. And everything was normal after that. But, you know, my dad was the kind of dad that took me camping every summer. And when we went camping, uh, it wasn't so much using all sorts of fancy kind of camping tools. It was you have a knife, and if you have a knife and, you know, maybe a way to make fire in the woods, you have everything else you need. And we would do some... We brought tents and sleeping bags, but we he taught me some survival stuff, too. And it was a lot of fun. I really liked it. But a knife was still just a means to an end at that point. I joined the Army almost right out of high school. Uh, I always knew I wanted to join the Army, but my dad really wanted me to be an officer. I messed around in college for a little bit, and by messed around, I mean I took up space and did not go to class, because if nobody was making me go to class, I wasn't going to class. I just was not ready to do, you know, more class, and I just wanted to really join up. I have a long family history in the military. The Army is where I bought my first kind of real knife, I'll say, for myself, and it was a Benchmade Griptilian. And I'm not going to tell you the year, but I was the kind of guy then who would, you know, look at the BX or the PX in those days and get a fancy flashy knife from one of those little carts and think I had something amazing and really cool. And one of my instructors in medic school saw me with it one day, you know, trying to cut the extra straps off a you know, bandage I had tied and said, what the hell are you doing with that piece of shit? And I was like, what are you talking about? This is really cool. This is blah, 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 blah. And, you know, all the line of crap the guy sold me when I bought it and he goes, no, that is not, that is a, whatever. and he was able to rattle it off and say, that is, and I said, no, 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 you don't understand, I'm like, no, he, you don't understand, take your knife, I'm like, yeah, he had me hold it, blade, and handle it, he goes, now bend it a little bit, and I'm like, what, and he goes, bend it, and I, just a little bit of pressure, and it was like, honestly, I don't remember the brand, so it was something like M Tech or TAC Force, something like that, and I did a little bit like that, and I heard a crack, and then a screw flew out, and I remember this, you know, I don't remember the brand. And the whole thing basically just started coming apart. And boy, was I embarrassed. And he goes, that's a piece of crap, you know? That's, and, and you're not the first one to fall for that. But here's what you need to do. I'm gonna give you this knife. And he gave me a Benchmade. He goes, you get to carry this one until you buy one of your own. But, you know, you need to, Listen, a knife is a serious thing out in the field, especially for a medic, because you can use it for blah, 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 blah. And that sort of started me off on understanding that not all knives were created equal, that some were good, some were bad. And so the next day, which this was a Friday, so the next day, which was a Saturday, I went to the PX and I started looking around at this little cart and I started noticing. That's when I first started looking critically at Griptilian. And so they sold it there and I, I bought a Griptilian because I had become very comfortable using it. And there was my first Benjamin, first knife I bought for myself. Uh, I lost it out in the field one day, I wish I still had it. I wasn't a collector yet though. I was just just a utility user of knives at that point. I didn't buy knives that often um, because I was all into buying a, a high quality knife that I would use until I needed to buy a new one. That usually meant somebody stole it or I lost it or I broke it. Tillions are on the cheaper end of the Benchmade spectrum, but they really are. They, they stand up to a lot of use, and the thing, if you're going to break, in my experience, if you're going to break a Gripillion, you're going to break the tip off, you know, using it inappropriately, using it to pry or as a screwdriver, and I've done that a lot, unfortunately. So that's usually when I'd have to replace it. For several years, you know, I've been issued many knives on deployment. The military issues out a lot of knives. Surprisingly enough, the Air Force has issued me more knives. Now, I also want to state that I know people, you know, inter-service rivalries, we make fun of each other. I have been deployed more on the ground in a combat environment in the Air Force than I ever was in the Army. My job in the Air Force, and I don't want to get into it now, is a ground combat role. Have you? But the military does not issue out pieces of crap. When they send you to war with a knife, they usually give you something good. And I've been issued many, many Benchmates. I've been issued uh, some bucks. I've been issued uh, a SOG once. Um, I've been issued a couple Leatherman tools. I've been issued in my life, nor known anyone who has been issued a TAC Force or an M Tech or you know anything like that. On the other hand, I've also never known anybody that's been issued a Kershaw or you know a CRKT because they don't really they just they don't make knives with that in mind. They make good knives, but it's not hard work users that they produce. Uh, now I know they're starting to make some better ones, but they, for the most part, they're 
kind of EDC focused, uh, very, very nice knives, but not, you know, for the utilitarian carrier. Really, the heart of the story comes to 2010. We were one of the last uh, Air Force ground command and control units, you know, directing, you know, aircraft for close air support and everything uh, in Iraq for the transition from Operation Iraqi Freedom to Operation New Dawn, known as, you know, the knife guy, because I always had a knife in my pocket no matter what. Uh, usually more than one, just because sometimes I couldn't decide which one I wanted to carry. Uh, and when I was bored, I would just, I had one old Benchmade Striker, uh, uh, Model 912, that I would just sharpen. And, you know, if you're familiar with the 912, it's a, it's a Tonto. I had sharpened that thing into a drop point just because I, I just, that was my stress relief. Just, I like the sound of the shh, shh across the, the sharpening stone. Captains there had made an offhanded comment about something like, well, I, I bet you can't, I bet you can't buy, you know, 20 knives on this deployment. And I was like, dude, I can go buy 20 knives, you know, at the BX right now. You know, we're at a main base. We're, we're, we're at a lot. I can, and he was like, no, 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 no. If we're going to do it, we have to have rules. And so he made up a series of rules for like what knives I was allowed to get and what I couldn't and, and all this other stuff. And so that really started my collecting because I had to look really critically at the knives I was buying and pick them out for different reasons. Of finding 20 knives that fit the criteria and that really built my collection. And what I did with them once I was done and I won the bet and he, I know this sounds juvenile, but he had to buy pizza for the entire crew. Pizza party. I ended up giving most of those knives away to the younger members who were like on their first deployment. And at that point, the money for deployments was drying up. So we didn't all get issued two knives and four new pairs of boots and two pairs of Oakleys and all the stuff like we got issued just a few years you know, back when all the money in the world was there for deployments. I gave it to a lot of the, the younger newbies on their first deployment and everything who had crappy knives and stuff like that. At least started my real collecting. So it hasn't been that long. And it really started my critical look at different knife brands and different knife types and really started my, my research into knife steels and handle materials. And, you know, I didn't know what G10 was until then. I didn't know that there was a difference between plain plastic and, you know, glass fiber reinforced nylon and Norl GTX. Vinyl, I didn't, you know, I would look at a knife and say it's got a plastic handle. I didn't know what there were different names for them until then. But with me, cool, yay. That deployment in March of 2011, and uh, we headed back out the door in January of 2012, which is my last combat deployment before coming to here to Florida on an instructor gig, which is nice because no deployments. The one where I started learning about knife modification, and I really so this is now trans transitioning out of how did I start collecting into how did I start a YouTube channel, and really. Um, learning about the the kind of the really high-end stuff and I still hadn't owned any of like I hadn't owned a Strider I hadn't had a Chris Reeves I had heard about this mythical thing called the Hinderer um, I, you know I still the most expensive knife I owned to that point was probably a $250 knife uh, and I know that that's that's a really big deal for a lot of people too so I'm not like saying like $250 blah, blah. no I'm not um, I, I get it that's a lot of money but I had not ventured into the really high end you make a lot of money and it's tax free. So, you know, you, you get a lot of extra money for being there too, especially when you have a family that's back home. So I had a little extra money to spend. So that was a, a big kind of thing for me was when I bought my first Strider and it was an SNG, which I don't have anymore because I traded it off. The SNG is a little small, but I got it used and it was still like 450 bucks. Uh, I got a Benchmade Gold class on that deployment. Uh, it was a 940, which you'll see when I do the complete collection you know, review thing. Um, then I learned about knife customizations and everything, and that looked really cool. And I wanted to try that. I really wanted to try that. I've always wanted to start my own knife company. That's always kind of been my dream for when I'm out of the military, you know, when I started studying about steels and construction and, and what makes a good knife or a bad knife, I want to make my own knife company. And Not going to happen, but I'd like it to happen. It's a fiercely competitive market and breaking into it is very, very hard. Watching like Tough Thumbs, for example, watch a lot of Tough Thumbs. He's a genius and a true artist with what he can do. And a lot of the changes that he makes on knives are purely aesthetic, but beautiful stuff. And I figured what a great way to learn the ins and outs of knives.
to start doing that. Now at the same time, I'm coming to get you. But it was only five dollars each, so I bought three of them. I had these three Kershaw compounds sent to my APO address lying around, and I said, this is what I want. I want to start with this. And in the Tough Thumb videos I saw, he did some work with what he called Jade G10, which is also known as Translucent Green. That's what I want to work on. That's what I want to do that. So I ordered myself a Dremel and some tools and uh, researched, you know, where to buy G10 and everything and ordered G10, and I said, I'm going to do this. I started to do it, and I said, oh shit, I have no idea what I'm doing. So, I decided I was going to, for the first time ever, I didn't have a YouTube account, I just kind of surfed, you know, on my own. Um, I was going to make a YouTube account, and I was going to make a video, and I was going to put it up there, and see if anybody watched it and could offer me advice on the process. That's all. That's what my YouTube account started as. A very crappy, poor quality camera. Uh, you know, I haven't watched the video in forever. I'm going to put, I'll put a little card over there where you can click and watch. I'm also gonna put a link to the video in the description. Um, but I made this knife. And it's a two-part video, so I'll put a link to part one and you can watch part two if you want. This became this. This is incredibly painful with my messed up shoulder. This was my very first knife customization project while I was deployed. And I'm particularly proud of it because I did it while I was deployed and had to uh, find places to work on it and everything. And it is far from perfect, but it's pretty damn good. Uh, and I managed to, first time out, keep the spring assist in there, which meant a lot of milling and stuff in here, which caused a drastic mistake over there, but still. Um, uh, you know, this was the very first thing I ever did. And my channel started with a single video that said, could you guys give me some advice? Somebody talk to me about how to do this better. And there were no comments on it for a while. And I was like, all right, well, you know, I have one video and nobody knows who I am, so whatever. So I'll do another one. So I did a second one, which was the uh, CRKT Razzle that I gave away in the giveaway, so I don't have that. Uh, but I did some more, and I just kept doing more, and I kept making videos because I said sooner or later somebody's going to maybe see one of these and might be able to tell me, you know, hey, you could do this a little bit better if you do XYZ. So I took the CRKT M16, I think it's a ZSF, and this is originally a Tonto blade as well, and I'll put links to all these videos because you can't put a whole bunch of cards all at once uh, in the video. So I did this while I was deployed, and this was the first one where I did some real cutting on the blade and some blade modification. This was originally a Tonto, and I just like the shape better. Um, and this had a part one to it. Part one disappeared because I just recently showed it to somebody. Um, but you know, I kept these ones because these were the first ones I did. I modified my Benchmade 950. And this guy needs a little bit of work still. I never finished this one. I made these blue and black scales for it while I was downrange deployed. And then I started to do like a mirror polish on the blade, but I just never finished it up. The old 912 striker I went a little crazy with. I went very crazy with. But just messing around. And that's how the channel started. It started with a single video, which was, I need some help, can you guys help me? And it kind of grew out of that. And I, I would make the videos also, not just to put online, but so I could go back and watch the videos later and sort of watch my process at work. Because the videos I put up online were obvi obviously very edited. I couldn't put the entire video up in hours of work, you know? The same thing now, it, it would be done in in an hour, maybe two. Um, this took me hours upon hours of work spread over a couple days. You I know. ordered kind of new pieces to my collection. I had seen other people do unboxings, and I said, you know what, I'll, I'll do an unboxing, why not? gain a little bit of traction. I had never intended this channel to be what it has become today. It has blown my mind. Really became a great sounding board for me to bounce ideas off of a wide audience. You know, I could ask a couple friends, hey, does this sound like a good idea? But there's always that, you know, some friends are going to be like, yeah, that's a great idea, man. That's a great idea. You should do that because they're your friends. The internet is, is ruthless and merciless. So, you know, you ask the internet, is this a good idea? And if they say it's a good idea, it's because it's a good idea. If it's not a good idea, they're going to let you know in brutally honest terms, you're a fucking idiot. That is a stupid fucking idea, right? 
it gives an opportunity to kind of show off some work and to see what people's reaction is to it. Like, is this something that people even like? Is this, I think this is cool, am I out of my mind? Uh, the reason I have ads in my videos, and the only reason I have ads in my videos is because you're not gonna make a lot of money on YouTube unless you are like Smosh, or you have you know millions of views on every video. I make a tiny, tiny little bit, and you know, a very tiny, tiny little bit on YouTube. And that is only to offset the cost of ordering new materials and ordering things for unboxings and stuff like that. And I'll tell you the money I make on YouTube, if you think YouTube is a giant money, and some people make a lot of money on YouTube, I don't, it offsets the cost a little bit. It doesn't even begin to cover it. Um, that's another question I was asked, like how do you make money on YouTube? And there, there's also, you can read that online, so I won't waste your time with it. A, um, a fraction of what I spend, though. Uh, I'm willing to spend it because I have a lot of fun doing it. I do. And it be annoying for you guys to have ads and everything, but the channel means more giveaways. More stuff on the channel means more fun. It means you guys get to see, you know, unboxings of stuff before you spend money on it. Or and if it's everybody, it really does. Well, spending more money on the channel than I ever make out of it. And that's something you need to take into account if you want to make your own channel. You don't make a lot of money. Well, most people, the vast majority of people on YouTube don't make money. We don't. It just, it helps keep the channel going a little bit. Rambling a little bit. So the follow-up, if you wanted to make your own channel, how do you start? It's a lot to keep up with the chat with the YouTube channel. You've got to make new stuff. You've got to make videos. Editing videos kills me. I hate editing. Some people don't edit videos. Some people just shoot and put it up there. But um, I, I like to edit. I like videos that are long as is. You should see all the crap I edit out. I think there's a lot, especially when I'm working with Aiden. Aiden loves to be in the videos. But when I ask Aiden, hey, what do you think of this? If I don't monitor him, he'll go on for 20 minutes. And he will start with, I think that's a cool looking knife, and end up with a speech about Lego Batman. You know? So there's a lot of editing involved before a video goes up. And I think kind of a general rule of thumb is, for whatever the length of the final video, you spend three times as long as that in editing. Like, rawr, I'm coming to get you. Film and upload. All YouTubers do. I try to answer every single comment. I do. You might just get a one word thanks. It doesn't mean I don't like your comment, but you know, I try to answer every single comment and squeeze it in with everything else I have going on all day. There will be haters and there will be trolls. How you choose to deal with them is how you choose to deal with them. I think you all know how I choose to deal with them. It's a lot of fun for me. Uh, I don't care how it's perceived, honestly. I feel like people that are in touch with this channel and in touch with what we're doing around here understand why I answer those people the way I do. And I, I recognize that there are some people that are turned off by that and I probably lose a little bit of viewership. But I think that the people I'm trying to connect with and interact with really get it. So, oh well. Like I, mean, I said, the main channel description, this is not a safe space and this is not for special snowflakes and this is not a no hurt feeling zone. But, you know, I have a very simple rule. Treat me with respect and I'll treat you with respect. It's two-way street. Interacting with people, I think is a big part of what keeps the channel going. I, I, I take all these requests, which is why I say, hey, tell me what you want to see. Because I feel I like I had the magic formula um, so I could be at like 60,000 subscribers right now. Or, you know, I just watching a video today and it was a Star Wars video. So, of course, you know, it's a whole different bucket. But I had 480,000 subscribers. Smosh has like 5 million subscribers. Their videos are funny and I'm not that funny. But the cards were dealt in life. I apologize to you guys if this was not an entertaining kind of video, but the question was asked. So I'm answering the questions that were asked because like I said, you have to interact and you have to give people what they want. Formative, great. If it was entertaining, great. If it was not, I'm sorry. We'll get back to the regular stuff in the very next video. We'll get back to our shout outs. Like I said, uh, links down in the video description. Always, you guys are awesome. I appreciate all the support for the channel, and I'll be back again real soon.